Good morning and welcome to the service today. We're going to begin by standing and singing hymn number 402, Like a River Glorious. are fully blessed, finding as he promised, perfect peace and rest. I hope you have that perfect peace this morning. If you'd like to turn with me to the book of Second Chronicles, remember Chronicles was like the daily newspaper, see what was going on back in uh, Hezekiah's day. He was surrounded on this particular occasion by a vast enemy just outside the walls. But he probably woke up that morning, started singing this song, and things began to turn, okay? Stayed upon Jehovah, hearts are fully blessed, finding as he promised, perfect peace and rest. I meant to read this last week. Ezekiel Zider gave it to me as I was coming up the hallway, and I thought it was a personal note, but it actually addressed to the entire church family. And Ezekiel wants you to know that he was so thankful for everyone that stopped by his graduation party yesterday. Sorry for the last minute notice. I am blessed to have such an amazing church family. So that's from Ezekiel Zider. In Second Chronicles, what was going on back in the day, just the first eight verses is amazing. After these things and the establishment thereof, Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, came and entered into Judah and encamped against the fenced cities and thought to win them for himself. And when Hezekiah saw that Sennacherib was come and that he was purposed to fight against Jerusalem, what do you do now? Understand about a, an army of 200,000 versus a city that's smaller, geographically speaking, than the village of Arlington, Ohio. Been there. Very small place. You look outside the walls, skilled, disciplined soldiers versus the Pony League team. Who's going to win that one? Let's read on. Verse 3, he took counsel with his princes and mighty men to stop the waters of the fountains which were without the city, and they did help him. 
So there was gathered much people together who stopped all the fountains and the brooks that ran through the midst of the land, saying, Why should the kings of Assyria come and find much water? Also he strengthened himself and built up all the wall that was broken, raised it up to the towers and another wall without, and repaired Milo, the city of David, and made darts and shields in abundance, getting ready for the big showdown. Didn't need them, by the way. Verse 6, And he set captains of war over the people and gathered them together to him to the street of the gate of the city, and they spake comfortably up to them, saying, Be strong and courageous, don't be afraid, nor dismayed for the king of Assyria, nor for all the multitude that is with, with him. For there be more with us than they that be with them. And you're, you're able to say okay in this church, okay? Let me read that again. For there be more with us than be with them. And with him is an arm of the flesh, but with, him, with, with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And the people rested themselves upon the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. Stay tuned for the rest of the story this morning. Aren't you glad you came to church? Shake your head up, up and down, all right? All right. We need to pray, by the way. Uh, Steve Benjamin is leaving this evening, actually. He and Kim to go down to be ready bright and early in the morning, 5 o'clock, at the James Cancer Center treatment in uh, Columbus, Ohio, so let's pray for them. Families of the victims of this massacre in Virginia Beach, that was awful Friday evening. And then uh, the farmers, let's pray for them as well. A lot going on. Let's pray and look to the Lord. Lord, we're, we're so thankful to be able to be in your house this morning because we find ourselves in similar situations where Hezekiah was in Isaiah inside the wall. When we look out and about and see all the things that are happening in our world, it can be, from a human perspective, pretty bleak. But Lord, I pray you'd help us to lift up our eyes to the hills from which cometh our help, knowing our help comes from the Lord which made heaven and earth. And we would believe the truth of your word this morning. We would be set free. My heart does go out. I've been praying for Steve and Kim. What a wonderful couple. Such an encouragement to me personally. And I lift them up before your throne of grace this morning, asking that you'd intervene in a special way. Give the doctors and the nurses who will be providing care for them tomorrow morning great skill and wisdom beyond their years and bring Steve through this really, really well. Also, I think of the farmers. I thank you as I was out and about last night and seeing some of them able to get out in the fields, but it's been a very difficult situation, so we pray for patience and encouragement. Thank you that they're the backbone of this nation, providing food to so many around the world. Pray you to encourage their hearts this morning. We think of the, that tremendous tragedy down in uh, Virginia Beach, and we pray for those uh, responsible, Lord. Uh, sounds like the man actually responsible was taken out, but the family members now who are suffering, that this would be a real time of many turning to faith in Christ if they don't know him as Savior and Lord. I want to thank you for our graduates. I sat at the graduation last uh, Sunday afternoon just amazed. Uh, the young lady attends our church here and did such a wonderful job when she got up to give great honor and glory to the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you for our graduates who are representing you out and about in the world. Continue that great work here, Father, in the ministry. And let this church truly be a light in this community. So we love you and we need you as we come to the communion table. Help us to prepare our hearts so we can receive it correctly and bring glory to you through it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's take a minute or two or three and say good morning to folks around us, shall we?
Now as we start to find our way back to our seats, we're going to be singing the song Ancient Words. and please be seated. And let's have the ushers come forward. You won't want to miss tonight, uh, Morgan Haycock recently went over to West Africa, a nation that's uh, just over top of Togo and Ghana, and been learning about that place since you went over there. And also, uh, Carson Essinger is going to be here with us tonight. She just got back from uh, Panama City, Panama. And some of you in this room went down with us last summer, and she's going to give us an update regarding that as well. That's tonight at 6 o'clock in this auditorium. Uh, a couple of other announcements. Uh, Vacation Bible School is not that far away, the 23rd through the 26th. And you can see information about that in the bulletin. It sounds like we do need some volunteers, both adults and teens, if you would sign up in the lobby as you leave this morning or pray about where God would have you uh, work in that capacity. Next Sunday night is going to be a workers, uh, VBS workers night here at the church. And then the 15th of this month, a couple Sundays away or Saturdays away, uh, our daughter is coming up from Atlanta and she's having a wedding shower. So we're thankful for that. Lord, again, we love you and we're thankful for your goodness in our lives. You've blessed us in so many different ways. We stand in awe of you. And we've read the end of the book. We know how this thing's going to end. So we lift up our hearts before your throne this morning in worship, asking that you'd help us to join our hearts together collectively. We might seek your face and worship you like never before in this place at this point in time in history. We love you and ask it in Jesus' name that you bless this offering. Amen.
Let's please join together as we sing this morning. The bitter weary ways and the striving day by day you barely have the strength to pray in the valley low how hard your fight has been how deep the pain within wounds that no one else can see hurts too much to show all the doubt you're standing in between all the weight that brings you to your knees, He knows, He knows. Every hurt and every sting, He has walked the suffering. He knows, He knows. Let your burdens come undone. Lift your eyes up to the one. begins to shrink when you find the one who knows. Chains of doubt that held you in between. One by one are starting to break free. He knows, he knows. Every hurt and every sting, he has walked the suffering. He knows, He knows, let your burdens come undone, lift your eyes up to the one who knows, He knows. Every time that you feel forsaken, every time that you feel alone, For all things, and in him all things hold together. The grand earth is quakes before, moved by the sound of his voice, and sees that are shaken. Can be calmed and broken for my regard. And through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. And through it all, through it all, it is well. And through it all, through it all.
far be it from me to not believe, even when my eyes can't see, and this mountain that's in front of me will be thrown into the midst of the sea. And through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. And through it all, through it all, it is well. And through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. And it is well. It is well. So let go. responsible for helping us with music every Sunday morning. Wasn't that beautiful this morning? And it really sets the stage for what we're looking at in 2 Chronicles. If you're not turned there, turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 32. Through it all, it is well with my soul. My wife gave me a Rowry Study Bible when I first came to this church and been using it ever since. I've actually got something bigger than baling wire I would say I've got baling wire to hold it together now but I found some wire even bigger than that which holds it all together there was a lady that pulled up underneath the canopy uh, yesterday morning and she uh, had a huge SUV opened up the back of it and said I could have as many brand new Bibles as I wanted and she had the whole back of it stacked with brand new Bibles so I got a quite a few brand new Bibles in my uh, office if you need a good study Bible and one of them, among all the others, was a Ryrie study Bible. Had flashbacks about this one. Used, used to be brand new. <laughs> 
But every time I try to go use a, another Bible, I, I find that I've got, I know where that verse is over there. I even know what's written on top of that verse, and it's hard for me. So pray for me as I, I'm going to try one day to break away from this old Bible and, and uh, start using a, a brand new one, but we'll see what happens. Let me ask you this. Does anyone ever have any problems in your life? How about big problems? Is the Holy Spirit bringing to your mind right now a major problem that you're facing? And I happen to know our flock well enough to know that in this room this morning, there are people who are facing some major problems. And I'm glad you're in church this morning because the Bible is going to address your situation. How many of you ever woke up one, woke up one morning, again, the size of Arlington, Ohio, which is being very generous. Imagine a wall being encompassed around Arlington, Ohio. You wake up one morning, look over the edge, and there is a vast, almost innumerable army camped outside, and they want to take you out next. Like dominoes, they've been knocking cities off one by one by one by one, and you're next. What are you going to do? Where are you going to run to? That's what this chapter is about this morning. As we're finishing up here, the life of, of uh, Hezekiah, one of the good kings. And then I believe Josiah is the, the last good king of Judah. And then we'll do something else for the summer. A challenge. I try to think of what's happening in the text of Scripture we're going to be looking at. And try to make it practical. I've got to tell you, and I've, I've been at this now 41 years as a believer. I, I've been there and done that. When I didn't know what God was going to have to do next to save my life, spiritually speaking, I've been challenged. What I want to do with this chapter is kind of break in in the middle of it. So if you turn with me to chapter 32, uh, around verse 20 down in through there, you'll see words like Hezekiah and the prophet Isaiah. That's the good news. You're not in that walled city alone. Isaiah was the same Isaiah that wrote... The prophetic book, the book of Isaiah. Very godly man who was giving advice to Hezekiah during this whole ordeal. So Isaiah, Hezekiah, the Bible says in verse 20 here, they cried out to the God of heaven, right? Is that what your Bible says? And God went to work and he took it from there. If you read the immediate context, the reason why they get together and cry out to the Lord, it's because the enemy was blaspheming the name of God. Now, has anyone read the local newspaper this week and see the name of God being blasphemed in your community, yes or no? What are you going to do about it? Have a look at verse 17. A lot of psychological warfare was taking place here. The enemy even wrote a letter. Verse 17 says that uh, he wrote letters to rail. That word means literally in the Hebrew to blaspheme, to reproach, to defy. Look at verse 17. He wrote letters to defy the Lord God of Israel and to speak against him saying, as the gods of the nations of other lands have not delivered their people out of mine hand, so shall not the God of Hezekiah deliver his people out of mine hand. Then they cried with a loud voice in the Jewish speech unto the people of Jerusalem that were on the wall to frighten them and to trouble them that they might take the city. And they spake against the God of heaven, the God of Jerusalem, as against the gods of the people of the earth, which were the work of hands of man. And for this cause, Hezekiah, the king, and the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, prayed, and they cried to heaven. Look down at verse 22. It says, the Lord Jehovah, notice all capital letters in verse 22, saved Hezekiah. And beyond that, at the end of verse 22, he guided them on every side. I mean, that gets my blood boiling right there. To know that God's people were outmanned, they were outnumbered, they were outskilled, they didn't know what else to do except to get on their face and cry out before God, and God delivered His people. You know, we serve that same God today. 
he can do the very same thing for you. So these two men got together because the enemy thought they could uh, engage in blasphemous activity. They got together. They cried out to God, God, what are you going to do? And see, the chronicle understands you've read 2 Kings. The chronicle takes for granted that you've read the book of Isaiah. You know that what else is put here. It's not here. But the Bible says in 2 Kings 18, they took that letter. They spread it before the Lord. And it's like, God, you see this letter? It's against your name. What are you going to do about it? God sent his angel that night. The next morning, they woke up, the Bible says, 185,000 of the Assyrian army were destroyed with a single angel that had been sent from heaven. Isn't that wonderful? Aaron, could you turn me up just a little bit more, please? I, I'm, I'm excited about this. I want people to get this message, okay? Thank you. So the scene looks something like this. Back in the old days, that's what cities looked like. That's what Jerusalem looked like. Scouts up on the wall. People who care about their city planted up on the wall. And again, I've been inside the old city of Jerusalem. It's, it's smaller than the community of Arlington, Ohio. But camped outside, I did a little bit of the math this week for you. Four and a half times the population of Finley, Ohio, comes in and camps around your little bitty community. What are you going to do about it? Not much you can do about it except cry out to God, right? But when you cry out to God, that's good enough, isn't it? He'll take it from there. <laughs> I'm good at that, God says. I'm good at these types of things. By the way, I just threw this in. This is just, uh, it won't cost you any extra. But you know what? Your situation that God brought to your mind a while ago it's probably not as complicated as you think it is. My dad was in the um, nursing home for the last, I think, 10 years of his life. Mom passed away. They put dad in a nursing home. And I didn't know what to get him for Christmas. You ever been in one of those situations? You've got your, your dad everything he ever wants. He's pretty, you know, self-contained in a nursing home. I didn't know. But I, I found out he loves little puzzles like this. So I'd go out and buy them. And then I'd get curious, how does the thing work, right? You find the instruction, and you do it yourself, or you give it to them. And I found this type of thing may look, it may, even if you try it, may, may drive you insane. But really, you just take those two things and twist them together, and you can pull them apart just like that, right? Now you know the secret. I, that, that, that won't cost you a thing right there. I just, just threw that in for your sake. <laughs> Here's what I want to get to. If you remember a while ago when I asked you, how many of you have a major, 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 major problem in front of you this morning, okay? I'm going to take you through the steps that Hezekiah walked through before we got to the middle of the chapter there. By the way, some of you may be wondering why you have these things so frequently in your life. You know, God's really wanting to grow you up. He's wanting to teach you some things. I find that when God drops a problem in my life, it's for my sake. I look in the mirror and find out where God wants me to change. What are you going to do? Well, let's look back at verse 1 of chapter 32 of the book of 2 Chronicles. After these things and the establishment thereof, Sennacherib, remember he's the bad guy, so color him in black. The king of Assyria came and entered into Judah and encamped against the fenced cities and thought to win them for himself. And when Hezekiah saw that Sennacherib was come and that he would purpose in his heart to fight against Jerusalem, here we go, verse 3, here we go, he took counsel. With his princes and the mighty men to stop the waters of the fountains which were without the city. And they did help him. You want to know as your pastor now for a few years. When I get a phone call and it's beyond me. You want to know one of the first things I do after I cry out to God for help. I'll call one of our elders. I say, sorry to bother you. I know you got a busy day. But I've got a problem that needs an answer. I find the first thing that Hezekiah did as the king of Judah, the godly king of Judah, he, got, he picked up his cell phone, he called in the authorities, the men underneath his leadership. He said, gentlemen, let's have a little drink of coffee here. We've got to talk about this situation because this is major. Life or death situation depends on it. You would be wise if you really want a godly answer to your difficult situation this morning to pick up the phone and to call somebody who spiritually is in the know. I've had people come to the door since I've been the pastor. Sit in my office minding my own business. Either knock on the door or walk in to my office door and say, Would you mind if I just went to the altar and prayed? I said, Help yourself. I've had both men and women do it, by the way. And they just come down to this altar because they just want to cry out. They've got a major issue on their plate. What are you going to do about it? I find, first of all, he sought godly counsel. Is that your... First, gut reaction, your instinctiveness to turn to godly people for wise counsel. 
Notice he got them all together in verse 3. Mighty men, princes, what are we going to do? By the way, if you read the other accounts that I referenced a while ago in 2 Kings and also in Isaiah, you'll discover that at this point in time, actually it's later on in this chapter, Hezekiah built a tunnel. He said, these people are going to camp outside the walls for a few weeks. We need water supply, right? He built what's called Hezekiah's Tunnel, about, what, 1,700 feet long. It starts outside, ends up on the inside of the city. It's very interesting. In John chapter 9, Jesus told the man he had spit on the ground and made clay and anointed his eyes. He said, go wash in the pool of Siloam. That's where it comes out on the inside of the old city of Jerusalem. But that's too much information. What's the basis of you making a wise choice? And especially to those who've just graduated or about to graduate, high school students, what's the basis of making wise choices in life? You want to know what it is? I've put four stars here because I can't think of anything more important that you need this morning when you go out the door. How do I make wise choices? Number one, you've got to find out who am I ultimately going to serve. When I gave my life to Jesus Christ, I drove a stake in the ground and I said to him, Lord, I'm now, from here on out, I'm going to follow you. And I've had to remind myself of that decision many times throughout life. Because now the decision brings God into the picture. God, it's all about you. I think I can hear Hezekiah saying, Lord, this is your town. This is your city. You know what they've just done. They blasphemed your name. Here's evidence. Here's the letter. And this morning, if you've never come down to an old-fashioned altar... And gotten before God and said to him, Lord, I surrender to you completely. I know I'm saved. I know I'm on my way to heaven. But it's been a long time, Lord, since I've just surrendered my life to you. I'm going to encourage you in this service to do just that. This decision over here is going to be affected by the decisions I made right here. I drove a stake in the ground. When I walked down in Iowa one day and stood right about here somewhere in a church service... And looked at the pastor and said, I'm going to take this girl for the rest of my life. So help me God. And that makes a lot of other decisions a lot easier for me. It puts things in perspective. That's all in the world Hezekiah was doing. Lord, this is your battle. This decision is a reflection of a decision we made to follow you. And now this is your issue is just as well as mine. I was thinking on this, some of you have this in your house. I've noticed I've been out and about, maybe on your front door. It's out of the book of Joshua. As Joshua is coming to the close of his life, he gathers God's people together. and He says, let's make this very simple. I'm not going to be around much longer. But I need you to make a choice. I need you to drive the stake in the ground, right? If it seems unreasonable, evil for you to serve the Lord, all right, then you choose. Whether the gods that your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Canaanites and the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, the choice has already been made. We made that choice a long time ago. And now the smaller choices, decisions that we're making are a reflection of that major choice. By the way, unfortunately, Joshua did not do what Moses did for Joshua. Moses prepared Joshua, passed the torch to him, and Joshua went over the mighty flooding Jordan River, crossed over, conquered the land, and claimed the inheritance. But Joshua never raised up someone to follow him. You turn to the next book, the book of Judges in the Bible, and what's it say at the beginning, end of the book? Every man was doing that which was right in their own eyes. By the way, the world we live in today, you want to know why? Because we've never made this kind of decision right here. I'm, what I'm simply saying is if you drive a stake in the ground and say, Lord, I give my life to you, all the little decisions that come down the pike now must reflect on that major decision. That's all in the world Hezekiah is doing. Let's turn the coin over. You want to know what the basis is for making foolish, stupid decisions? It's very simple. Don't make it difficult. Double-mindedness. Going back on the ultimate commitment you made to the Lord. I was driving the other night down to Lima, took a back road, two-lane highway. A squirrel starts coming across the road. Now, I'm up to speed. I, I, I cannot possibly stop. 
But he ran so quickly, he ran into the other lane. And I said, Phew, good. Because I'm not really an animal lover, but I don't like running over squirrels. But he got in the other lane, and guess what he did? You know where I'm going, don't you? He changed his mind. He turned around, and he went back from the direction he, he came from. And unfortunately, don't tell animal lovers, but I ran over him, okay? Rough couple of days since then, but that's what happened. <laughs> what does the Bible say about making decisions? I'm thankful for our elders. They know it. I won't make a major decision here in this place unless it's, we're in agreement with it. Because the Bible says, where no counsel is, the people fall. But when you get a multitude of counsel, there's safety. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes. But if you hearken to counsel, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, like the book of Judges, every man doing that which is right in their, their own eyes. But if you listen to counsel, you're wise. Listen to counsel, hear it, counsel, and receive instruction that you may be wise in your latter end. Now, again, let's go back to the scripture here. He took counsel, verse 3. Verse 4 says that so they gathered together, and they actually acted on the counsel. They started stopping up all the fountains. Why should the enemy have these fountains flowing outside the wall? Let's make them go way down to Jericho, places like that, to get their water. Verse 5, they do something else. They start amassing a bunch of uh, weapon systems and things like that. But here's the point I'm trying to make. When's the last time you went to somebody else for counsel? Or are you so proud that you don't think you need advice from anybody else? I uh, was touched about a month ago by a study that I did on Wednesday night and shared it with the people that gathered that Wednesday. I have been touched by that study probably more than anything else I've done in quite a while. But it was simply the fact that we really need our brothers and sisters in Christ. Would you agree with that? Did you know you're a part of something that's bigger than you are? And it's coming off the study of the book of Samson where that guy had an independent spirit. He didn't think he needed anybody's help, especially God's. Now, that's a problem. You come into the New Testament, and God gives us like four images that we need each other. Beloved, it says in, what is it, 1 John 3, 1. Now are we the sons of God. Did you know that if you're a Christian this morning, you're related to the person sitting in front of you, beside you, behind you, if they're truly a believer in Jesus Christ? And I know growing up in our home, there were seven people. We'd visit an old country church. We'd double the attendance. <laughs> they, they loved our family visiting that church. Take us all 15 minutes to get out of the van, but we go in there, and they, they're glad to have the Kellogg's. My brothers and I, we are so different. One of them is like a professional mechanic. I don't think about mechanics, but he does. One of my brothers builds a cabinetry. He stalls cabinets. He's like the Amish, I guess. He, I wouldn't know where to start doing that sort of thing. But we're, we're, we're different, but we, but we need each other. We're the same. How about this one? Some of you just came back from Columbus where, you know, unless you're playing an individualized sport, you need the person next to you, right? Imagine a basketball player. I guess the NBA Finals is tonight, isn't it? I don't know. Imagine St Seth Curry saying, hey, you, you guys, just go ahead and sit on the bench. I got this. Now, he's good, but he's not that good. We're members of the same body. You see that hand? All fingers are different. <laughs> the thumb especially is different from them all, but we all need each other, don't we? And we're soldiers in the same army. So Hezekiah understood, if we're going to win this thing, I need to seek godly counsel. I'm asking you this morning, when's the last time you humbled yourself? And you sought a brother or sister in Christ. And you sat down with them and said, you know what, I, I, I need some help. What does God's word have to say about this issue? I'm just saying that's where he started. Now, when they give you advice, and what struck me in these first few verses is the fact they incorporated the advice. How many of you, once you receive advice, would actually go at step number two and put it into practice? I find that people who don't listen to their authorities, and by the way, gentlemen, God has put a godly wife next to you for a reason. I really believe the wife God has given her, if she's a godly wife, a sixth sense, maybe a seventh sense. She's trying to warn you not to buy that great big ticket item. 
I could hug my wife right now. She's told me no. But I'd go see a car in the parking lot and say, isn't that a great car, honey? And I can read body language. It's okay. <laughs> that means no, by the way, okay? <laughs> but because I've waited, I want to go down and now and hug her, but that would not be appropriate. Anyway, if you're not listening to your authorities, and God puts you in a home so that you learn to do that, Right? Sometimes kids don't get that, so they go off to school, and the principal has to become their authority. Sometimes they don't learn it there. I, I don't want to listen to my authorities. I'll go, do, I'll, I'll go join the military. Doug, how's that going to work? <laughs> well, in boot camp, you learn right away you're not the authority. And listen, if they don't win, learn it there, then they'll have to be incarcerated. I'm just struck with, by the fact that Hezekiah, first thing he did, he realized... I need help. I need somebody else to help me through this major decision. When you don't listen to your authorities, teenagers, you're basically saying things like this. Husbands, if your wife is trying to tell you something, these are the things that you're, you're communicating if you're not listening to what they're saying to you. That's enough of that. Let's go to number two. What happened next? Look with me now at verses, what, six through eight. It gets really rich in through here. The next thing he did, according to verse 6, he set captains of war over the people and gathered them together to, to him in the street of the gate of the city, and he spoke comfortably to them. Now, how many times when you're reading your Bible does it tell you how they said something? That struck me this week. He spoke comfortably to them. And I'm thinking to myself, you mean God is even concerned about how I say something to somebody? Of course he is. You know, you communicate a lot with your tone of speech. The word comfortably here has the idea that he was inspiring these people with the idea that, hey, with God's great help, we got this. Not myself, but under the hand of God, we can do this. Now, if you have a situation in your life where you're the authority like Hezekiah was, you've got people underneath your authority, you need to learn to speak in such a way that it's believable. That I can't do this by myself, but I'll tell you what, there's a God in heaven who can do it through me. I told my wife studying this this week how thankful I am for her because she communicated these types of things into our children. Parents, you know why that's why God made you children, given you children? <laughs> so that under your leadership you can speak into them and inspire them. And then I began to look at it a little further. Verse 6, the tone of voice, he spoke comfortably. But beyond that, this is what he actually said to them. Look at verse 7. Be bold and be brave. Don't be afraid. That's what I saw last Sunday afternoon at the commencement ceremony. Someone who just stood up, not drawing attention to themselves, just being who they were. And I thought to myself, wow, that's incredible. Actually reading Scripture at a public commencement, actually praying a prayer and using the Lord Jesus Christ's name at the end of it. I was just swept away. I said, praise the Lord. That's where it's at. He spoke to them comfortably and said, look, guys, be bold and be brave and don't be dismayed. For the king of Assyria and for all the multitude that is with them, for there be more with us than be with them. I'm telling you, if you're in positions of authority, parents, that's what your children need to see. That if you ask me individually, human to human, I don't know how we're going to get through this. But what I want to communicate into their life is there's a God in heaven who's got this covered. Your tone. Then he gave him in verse 7 God's truth. When he told him there's more with us than be with them. And then in verse 8, he created an atmosphere. where Look at the word rest here. Verse 8, with man is the arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And the people rested themselves on the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. That word literally means what it suggests. That if there was a reclining chair right here this morning, you sit in that thing and you just recline, you relax, you rest. You're trusting now in God. I'm thinking, well, praise God for a leader like this, Hezekiah. 
the armies that have been successful knocking one city off like dominoes, they were falling, you're next. In fact, if you look geographically, which is what I like to do when I study the Bible, it would be like they're down in Lima. They've knocked Lima off. They've come over to Bluffton. They've been through Genera. You can see them now on the horizon, and they're waving banners, and they're saying, you're next. What's happened to them is going to happen to you. And he communicates to the people of his day by his tone of voice, getting them to trust in Almighty God. They lean back, and they rest on his words. Is that not fascinating? What we're talking about here is someone who's able to motivate other people to action. Actually do something. By the way, when you study spiritual gifts, you'll discover that among the seven or eight spiritual gifts in the New Testament, God gives us people who can motivate other people. How many of you have been to a football game or a basketball game where there were cheerleaders on the sidelines? That's what this word is. Bob, I'm not asking you to be a cheerleader down at the football game, but that's what the word means. Okay, (laughs) in Scripture, how do you know if you have the gift of motivation? A true motivator in your midst is not committed to their spiritual growth. Because some people do that, you know. They want to study the Bible so they can get a big head, and they miss the heart of it. But it's so that other people will grow as you grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord. As a matter of fact, several verses in the New Testament, here are a couple of them. Paul, when he wrote to the Galatians, he said, my little children, I have travailed in birth. And, you know, when I read that, I, I have been there when my wife gave birth to both of our children. Honestly, it makes you thankful you're a male, but that's a different story. <laughs> but how many of our leaders in this room this morning, spiritually speaking, if you could describe your heart? For the body of Christ at Arlington, do you travail in birth so that Christ is being formed, his image in the people that he's placed here under your trust? Here's another one. We preach and we warn every man. We teach every man in all wisdom. Why? For ourselves' sake? No. So that we can present every man perfect before Christ Jesus. If you're a true motivator, you're committed to seeing other people grow spiritually. Number two, you're committed to taking practical steps of action. That's exactly what's happening here. They're outmanned, they're outnumbered, but here's what we're going to do. Basically, when you get right down to it in verse 8, we're going to trust God. They cultivated hope for real solutions. Verse 7, he gave them a motivation speech, be strong and be courageous, don't be afraid. We're going to trust in God here. And here's the big one. This ought to be the desire of every heart here in this room who desires to have leadership at Bible Fellowship Church. Our intent is to concentrate on turning people's problems into actual benefits. Did you know, for example, when Paul wrote to the book of uh, the believers at Rome, he got to chapter 5 and he was making a big deal about being justified by grace. And he said in chapter 1, verse 5, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Aren't you glad for that? And all God's people said, Hallelujah. But he just started. He went on to say in verse 2, Now, you got saved by grace, by whom Jesus Christ also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, we glory in tribulation. Remember I started out by asking you how many of you have a problem, major problem. Paul, when he wrote to the believers, he suggested that their problems, when they came into their life, after they trusted Christ as their Savior, is like putting weights on a barbell. We we glory, let's put another one right over there. I need a little bit more strength. We glory in tribulation because we understand that tribulation is working in producing character in the lives of God's people. Patience comes experience, experience comes hope. My wife and I were out for a walk yesterday, and I'm exposed to a lot of material through the week, so I just remember telling her on the walk, I said, you ever thought about this? Patience toward other people is love. Patience toward yourself is hope. 
And patience toward God is faith. Patience. We all need patience, don't we? He says when you go through trials, it develops patience. Patience brings experience. Experience, hope, hope makes not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which he's given unto us. Now, let me just tell you in verses 9 through 23 that there's a lot of psychological warfare going on. And I suggest to you that that's exactly how Satan seeks to undermine God's people in this room this, this morning. He wants you to think you're going to fail. Look at verse 10, for example. Here comes the enemy, and he's telling the people up on the wall, why in the world would you put your trust in Jehovah? He's going to fail you. So we got two contradictory worldviews here. King Sennacherib, who comes from Assyria, which is over the capital that is in Mosul, which is modern day. Uh, Mosul, where our troops were fighting when we took it down Iraq. It's the same place where Nineveh is located. And they were ruthless, ruthless, ruthless people, much like the terrorists of our day. And they basically were saying up on the wall, look at verse 11. Does not Hezekiah persuade you to give over yourselves to die by famine and by thirst, by saying the Lord your God is going to deliver you out of the hand of the king of the sea? Just on and on and on and on and on thinking these people were going to actually give up, but they didn't know what was going on inside. Hezekiah had called those people over, and he told them. He was speaking comfortably to them, helping them put their faith and trust in Almighty God. There's a point and a time in this story where Hezekiah goes to Isaiah. Isaiah encouraged him together to go into the temple of the Lord and spread out this letter of blasphemy before the Lord and basically tell the God of heaven there it's directed towards your name God now what are you going to do about it by the way which is a good way to pray just bring God into the situation God I bring you into the situation now what are you going to do about it passage of scripture says we're to call upon the Lord in the day of trouble why do we do that For two reasons so he'll deliver us and number two after he delivers us, we can glorify him. I, I've been in those situations. I don't want to bore you with them. But just came back from a city I'd never seen before. On a Greyhound bus. I got beside my bed and I said, Lord, I, I'd love to go to that college. You just let me spend three days there. I love it. But I don't have any money. But if you want me to go, supply the resources. <laughs> just like that. God enabled me to. Get a work scholarship. I call. He delivered me. And I don't pat myself on the back. It's all up to him. He did the rest. And I could go through story after story after story. What God has done. In my life that way. When I cry out to God. And I want you to notice this down in verse 20. Hezekiah and Isaiah got together. And they cried out to God. It's the best way to express to a God up in heaven. That you're genuine. Like a baby cries out for its parents. Why? It's totally dependent upon them. It expresses, Lord, I'm raising the white flag. I, I, I have no ounce of energy to do this spiritually. I'm just giving it over to you. You're appealing directly. You want to get God's attention? You want to get God's attention? Don't just pray. Cry out to God. Many times in Scripture, I find men, whether they're on their knees, flat on their face, standing even, crying out to God, and it gets his attention brought back memories this week when our children were babies two o'clock in the morning when they start whining two o'clock in the morning I start going I, act, I pretend that I'm snoring I don't think she ever bought it because I think she was out snoring me but then I'd give her the elbow uh oh whatever it is it's contagious when I cry out to God, it's telling God I'm trusting now completely in your divine resources for you to come through. Here are a few examples in Scripture. I went back to Jeremiah chapter 33 and found the context of this one that you can probably quote. Do you know where he was when he prayed this, by the way? The Bible says in the first couple of verses he was shut up in prison. And even in prison he cried out to God and said, Lord, I'm coming to you. 
I'm asking you to show great and mighty things which I don't understand. That's what the word understandeth or knoweth means. In the Psalms, it's just blanketed with David crying out to God. The righteous cry, the Lord's listening, and he delivers them out of all their trouble. I cry, and my enemies are turned back. This I know because God is for me. But I save the best for last. Notice back as I close this morning that they cried out to God. And I love this down in verse 22. It says, the Lord saved Hezekiah. And beyond that, he guided them on every side. It doesn't say it in this context, but you read 2 Kings and also Isaiah. And that night, the angel of the Lord killed 185,000 of the trained Assyrian soldiers. And delivered, God delivered his people. One day... In the ministry of Jesus Christ. I love reading this in Luke's gospel. Because it says this man was full of leprosy. Now it's one thing to have leprosy. But Luke the doctor said he was full of leprosy. And and he, he and Jesus had this encounter. And this man has such faith in Jesus Christ. The question is not can you do it. The question is will you do it. Because, Lord, you're God even if I don't get healed, right? How many of you are there? You've asked him to take away that ache, that pain. You know, Paul prayed three times, take it away. And God said, no, here's what I will do for you. I'll give you greater grace. The leper came to Jesus that day, full of leprosy. Lord, I know you can do it, but if it's your will, could you heal me too? You're here this morning. You've got your issue that I started out with. Would you lay it at God's feet this same way? Lord, I've got this trouble. It keeps me up at night. It bothers me. I need help. Lord, if you want to do something about it, would you do it? And remember what Jesus said. (laughs) Imagine you're full of leprosy. You come to Jesus and you say, Lord, here's my issue. I'm crying out. I'm begging you. And Jesus moved with compassion, put forth his hand and touched him. Imagine the holy, sinless Son of God touching a leper. And he said unto him, I will. It's my will for you that you be changed and cleansed. Be thou clean. And as soon as he spoken, immediately his leprosy departed from him. He was cleansed. Hey, we're about to come to the communion table this morning. So I want to transition into that. By asking you these three questions that we talked about this morning together. Number one. In your personal individual life, are you seeking counsel? Or do you need to start doing that? I go a step further. If you're seeking counsel, are you listening to the counsel that you're being given if it's biblical counsel? And number three, are you putting that into practice? That's exactly what Hezekiah did. Beyond seeking counsel, if you're a father, a mother, do your children, grandchildren see you speaking into their world? Worlds that... Words of such that God's got this. I don't know how mom and dad are going to get through this financially, but I know God does. And finally, are you spreading your problem out before the Lord, much like Hezekiah and Isaiah did, and just ask, bringing God into the picture and letting him answer on his terms? If thou wilt, you can heal me. Jesus moved with compassion and says, oh, I will. Be thou cleansed, and immediately he was made whole. Let's bow our heads together this morning and right there where you're sitting, let me ask you these questions once again. Do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Because if you don't know him in salvation, that's really where you need to begin. This morning we're going to sing a hymn that they sang in the little church where I gave my life to Christ. Just as I am without one plea. But I went back and looked at that hymn this week. And it's the third verse. I'd like us to sing at least through the third verse. Talks about through many things that come our way in life. God is using them to perfect our character, to develop us, to get us to where we need to be spiritually. So if you're here this morning, you're not truly born again. Or if you're not sure you're not saved, please come and seek advice, godly advice. We'd be glad to take God's word and show you how you can know for sure that you're going to heaven when you die. And then I want to ask the believers to prepare for this communion table. Is there anything in my life that I need to confess to him as known sin? 
and forsake that sin so we can come to this communion table with clean hands and truly celebrate the past, the present, and the fact that Jesus really is coming again. Aren't you thankful for that? Lord, bless this uh, invitation time and help us to examine our hearts in a healthy manner and uh, pray that you just accomplish your purposes through it as we make good decisions just now in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and sing just as I am, shall we? Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. I to before the church the little church we went to where I became a believer was a large church but every Sunday we sang that hymn right there I think it's got like six verses and then they'd finish with it they'd sing it again <laughs> they finished with it they sing it again so I went easy on you this morning okay we're coming to the communion table and uh, let's just bow our heads as we consider what a great God we serve how much he loves us you understand that in the upper